The following Kellogg Insight podcast is brought to you by the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. Whether you're looking for knowledge you can apply at work or a topic that will spark your creativity, Kellogg Insight is your destination for the latest ideas from Northwestern's top business faculty. Why do some retailers choose to be in outlet malls and others turn up their noses? The answer is all in the brand. In 2007, Kellogg marketing professor Ann T. Coglin and co-author David A. Soberman looked at the current state of the American outlet mall and why certain merchants have succeeded while others failed. The answer? Certain brands, including some very early upscale names like Coach, Ralph Lauren, and Calvin Klein, have discovered outlet malls as a way to segment their brands and profit handsomely. And as upscale brands began to widen their reach in outlet malls, outlet malls went upscale too. Today's centers look a lot more like traditional malls, with anchor stores, fancier surroundings, and even entertainment options. And the upscale outlet mall concept has clearly moved worldwide. In 2007, the oil-rich country of Dubai opened its first outlet mall with one million square feet of space. Where are outlet malls going? Writer Lisa Holton speaks to Ann Coughlin about the future of this popular retail channel. Welcome, Professor. Thanks. It's great to be here. Retail outlets clearly aren't what they used to be, nor are the centers that house them. Thirty years ago, there were hard-to-find shops in out-of-the-way places, and mostly they sold seconds and occasionally damaged goods to people who were willing to buy them. Today, they're found in clean, brightly lit centers, and they look a lot like the typical mall close to home. And the merchandise is a different story altogether. Outlet malls are clearly a success story, but why did you choose to examine them now? Well, I've always been interested in all kinds of questions having to do with distribution and retailing. And one of the very interesting things I kept seeing when I would shop both at regular stores and then also occasionally at outlet stores is I would think, you know, why is this retailer opening a store at the outlet mall, but not that one? Why is it that some do and some don't? Um, and so I decided it would be interesting to try to explain uh, why that's true, why it's uh, uh, natural for some kinds of products and retail brands, and why it just isn't a very good fit for other ones. So that's what sort of led me to it. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about the retail brands that have really succeeded in this area and why others make the decision not to even go there. Mm -hmm. So I think some brands choose never to go there that are truly, truly upscale exclusive brands. So if you think about wandering down North Michigan Avenue, you know, our fanciest shopping street here in Chicago, and think in your mind's eye about the brands that you're going to see there, some of them you will never see at an outlet store or an outlet mall. You'll never see um, a Gucci. You won't see Ermenegildo Zegna. Uh, but you will see brands like Ralph Lauren or Timberland or Eddie Bauer. And so I ask myself, well, what is it about the truly, truly high-end exclusive brands versus uh, the brands that have some high-end and some medium that makes them want to go uh, to an outlet mall where the other ones don't? Now, if your whole market is very, very, very high-end, then there isn't any point having an outlet mall or an outlet store at an outlet mall because there isn't anybody that wants to buy those kinds of products at an outlet mall. But when you start to have a mix of consumers, there could be a reason to split off some of what we in our work call the lows, that is the low service intensive consumers and send them off to the mall. Um, so that you're left with the high-end, less price-sensitive folks that you can serve at your mainline store uh, on a North Michigan Avenue or at a fancy mall that's a more standard mall rather than an outlet mall. So we've kind of focused on the consumer segmentation angle and what we've done. What's really interesting about your point about segmentation is that it seems to have driven the, the design of malls, the design of these centers as well. Talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. When you think about how these malls are designed and how they grow, there's some similarities to regular malls and then some divergences. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the very original outlet malls. In fact, the very first outlet mall in Chicago was called the original outlet mall. And it was in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Anybody that lived here back then 
remembers that as, uh, you know. It was a cinder block palace. A total cinder block palace. Service was completely absent. I can remember wandering around that mall, there not even being a bathroom you could find, much less food. Dressing rooms, none. Um, and the kinds of stores that would locate there would be strictly manufacturer's outlets. Everything would be literally a manufacturer's store, each one run by its own manufacturer, and importantly, no anchor stores. So what we mean by an anchor store is a store that usually is either broader line, such as a department store, or it has a special draw that makes it very broadly attractive to a whole lot of people and hence pulls people to the mall. And hence it is an anchor. And that the structure of a typical mall puts those anchor stores at corners, just as if they were anchoring down a picnic cloth or something like that. Now today, what we see is a little bit of a morphing of the old outlet mall uh, into something that has some larger stores. Uh, maybe not quite what you would think of as a standard anchor store at a, uh, uh, an upscale mall because department stores other than off uh, Saks Fifth Avenue are not there. Um, but you do have broader draw stores that they want to have located those kinds of malls. Um, at the Pleasant Prairie Mall up in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin, just over the border, uh, for example, there's a huge Nike store. Now, Nike, of course, is such a broad brand. It carries all kinds of clothes, shoes, and so on, that it might have a bigger draw than, say, Samsonite luggage, which is more of a specialty store. Right. Um, so that still is very much an outlet mall because the stores there are run by the manufacturers, and they carry uh, all kinds of goods, most at 20 to 30 at least percent off standard retail price. But now we have yet another kind of a mall, which is uh, a hybrid between a true outlet mall and a regular upscale mall. And the, uh, the great example of that in the Chicago area is Gurney Mills, uh, also up Route 94 in between Kellogg, uh, Northwestern, and the Wisconsin border. And that has stores in it, not all of which are outlet stores. Plus, it has true anchors. Um, and so one of its true anchors is not a department store at all. It's uh, the Rainforest Cafe. Mm -hmm. Another anchor is Bass Pro Shops. These are not standard anchors from standard malls, but they serve the same purpose. They anchor the entire place mm -hmm. and make it a destination shopping location, not just a collection of individual candle, apparel, shoes, kids' clothing stores. Mm -hmm. But it's not just about the merchandise. It's about entertainment. In fact, those malls have, uh, have sort of given rise to the name shoppertainment, which is one of these put together words. But the idea is, sure, it's for shopping, but it's a place the whole family can go. It is not just a shopper's uh, destination. It is a family destination. Um, and it's a place you could easily spend the whole day. Mm -hmm. And you contrast that with the original outlet mall in Kenosha, uh, your idea was how close is the closest diner so I can get out of here and sit, you know, uh, whereas a Gurney Mills wants you to stay all day. Mm -hmm. We've talked about price and the fact that most of these outlet stores do have a stated price advantage. Yeah. But how strong is that? Because uh, I'm, I'm of an age where I remember when outlet stores literally were you know, stuff dumped on a table, and yes, yeah. you could actually see a very, very clear price advantage. Mm -hmm. Today, uh, people wouldn't be coming unless they could save some money, but it doesn't seem to be as big an issue. Maybe it's bigger now during the economic slowdown, but right. talk a little bit about right. price and where that stands. Well, in the research that I've done, I actually did some secret shopping comparisons where a research assistant and I would go on the exact same day to one of us to an, to an outlet store and the other to a mainline department store to price compare the exact same stock keeping unit of the exact same brand to see truly what the price differences were on a specific day. So that's gonna be an important thing in what I have to say here. Um, when we did that experiment, we found across all the brands we looked at, across all the stores we looked at, that there was a distinct price advantage of the outlet mall. And it varied from brand to brand but it was somewhere around 30%. Now, the important sort of caveat or caution in what I'm saying here 
is that that's on a specific day. So it might be, you know, February 8th, right? Um, however, if you're willing to wait, if you're a consumer who not only, let's think about what you're giving up at, when you're an outlet mall shopper, not only willing to deal with the fact that it's not in your backyard, and so you've got to make a day trip out of this. You've got to travel the distance. You've got to be willing to keep what you bought because going back to return it if you made a mistake, not what you want to do, right? So you have to be willing to give up all of that. You may also have to be willing to wait a little bit of time, all right? So at the beginning of the fashion season, uh, for example, if it's the middle of the summer, that's the beginning of the fall fashion season at regular upscale stores. They have fall clothing in at that point in time. If you want to see that stuff at some of the outlet mall stores, you may have to wait until mid-September, end of September, before they're willing to stock those stores. Partly in deference to the upscale department stores to give them a little lead time, a little, you know, pricing lead time. Mm -hmm. uh, and partly because an outlet mall may well stock the product that got returned from the department stores back to the manufacturers who then need to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And so they'll put it mid-season into an outlet store where you can then find quite a good price. So there's the element of time that's added on uh, to the actual pricing observation as well. Mm -hmm. We're in a tough economy right now and people obviously are looking for bargains, but you are able to sort of split the pie very narrowly and see which outlet centers are far more successful and which ones are open to failure. Mm -hmm. um, could you describe the kind of outlet center that may not be doing so well right now? Well, interestingly, and I don't have the full answer to why this is true, the ones that are the most stripped down, no serviced kinds of malls are the ones that are failing. Uh, the ones that survive have a little bit more polished veneer. They look a little bit like a regular mall, but uh, they offer an image that gives you the idea that you're getting a deal. Mm -hmm. All right, so consumers do want a deal, but I think consumers don't quite quite want the, you know, apparel or clothing analog of the black and white bag of sugar that we all came to hate in generic grocery shopping, right? That we dislike, but we still want to feel we're getting a good deal. Mm -hmm. So the outlet mall that can kind of span those two desires, I think, is the one uh, that can survive. And again, remembering the distance you have to travel has to have enough to offer so that the consumer is willing to spend four, five, six, eight hours at that location. You can make the argument that Gurney Mills was basically in a rural area. Absolutely. Uh, now it seems to have been swallowed into what is very much a developed suburban area. What does that do to the character of an outlet mall? Well, I think it does change it because uh, it's no longer quite as remote as it used to be. Um, there have been studies done that show the radius uh, of attraction for various kinds of malls. And an outlet mall historically has always drawn from a much larger radius than a standard, even upscale shopping mall. Um, that's what helped them survive when they were sitting literally in the middle of cornfields, which Gurney Mills was, horse farms, cornfields, and things like that. Um, now it doesn't have to worry quite so much about being super attractive because it's far away. It can offer a few more of the high service opportunities that, uh, that a standard mall or even an entertainment center might offer and still draw people because they even have proximity. Mm -hmm. Now there's an interesting issue not just at the consumer level but at the relationship with the standard department store level that bears mentioning here too. Mm -hmm. um, when outlet malls first began, there was a great hue and cry among standard department stores which sold those very same designers brands that were being opened by the manufacturers, by the designers themselves at, le at the outlet stores. So a big allegation of competition, uh, lower prices, you're gonna drive us out of business arose from the department stores. Of course that has not come to pass and I think the reason why is obvious. We can't always hop in our cars, travel an hour, uh, on the hopes of finding something t for 20% lower price. It just isn't worth it to us all the time. Um, but as these outlet malls start being in more developed areas, they look and act and are located just like a regular mall. Um, so to the extent that some department stores felt threatened in the past 
by this kind of competition, that competition may well be quite intensified. Uh, traditional shopping malls have problems of their own. Uh, we, can, we can point to the uh, traditional malls that are close to outlet malls as having a particular problem with outlet malls. Mm -hmm. But other than that, do they really face that much of a threat from outlet malls? Perhaps not any more than what we've said here, but they face a lot of other threats. Mm -hmm. um, one of the big ones that has been identified is simply a change in consumer behavior. Um, sometimes we joke about the differences between men and women in the way they shop, right? That uh, women might be willing to browse and wander and go from store to store, and men are very focused and task-driven, will drive up to the outside of the, the department store, walk in, buy one white shirt, walk out, and leave. Um, the interesting thing demographically that researchers have found is that women are now much more like men. They do not wander the mall. They do not sit around for hours with their friends and have lunch. They are too busy. Uh, and that means that the standard mall faces a real uh, shift in not only how consumers behave, but therefore how many visits the less than anchor stores can expect to get from the busy woman shopper. She isn't wandering the mall, she's going directly to the anchor store. So that little specialty shop that has the gift items never gets visited. So that creates a challenge for the mall. Um, the other huge challenge has to do with the lack of differentiation among department stores themselves. Um, I remember seeing an anecdote once about a woman who had actually been shopping inside a department store for a few hours, had found clothing to buy, walked up to the cash register, was looking through her wallet for her credit cards and said, what store am I at? She had no idea what store she was at. Well, that's a bad sign, right? It means that the department stores all carry brands that are the same as each other. They all carry Tommy Hilfiger, they all carry Ralph Lauren, they all carry Donna Karen, they all carry... So without the differentiation, they become less attractive individually, and that creates a challenge for malls as well. And we're also talking about tough times in buying gasoline, which gets yeah, you to true. the outlet mall. That's true. So now, when you think about traveling to an outlet mall, um, there are still, the majority of people who shop in an outlet mall will still travel 30, even 50 miles each way to get to that mall. Now, with the price of gas, well, it's a little lower at the moment, but let's say around $4 a gallon, all right? And if you're in a car that gets 20 miles to the gallon, and you're traveling 40 miles each way to get to the outlet mall, that's four gallons of gas round trip, 16 bucks. $16 just in transportation, not to mention maybe tolls and so on. Um, so now I start to think a little bit about whether it's such a good deal to go up to that mall and hope that I'll find what I want. I won't be able to return it. Plus, I've got the time I'm spending traveling. Um, so I think just the fact that people have started calculating the cost of gasoline causes the number of that kind of trip, the number of trips like that, to actually fall. And that's not so great for outlet malls. It means a lot more clumping of trips and maybe less bought per family from the outlet mall in a year. They'll pick the local convenient place because on net, the time and gas savings are worth it. So even the, the outlet malls that are doing everything right, their, their greatest fear is basically people just cutting back on their driving. It could be. You have to be willing to drive to get to these places. Again, unless you're taking a weekend trip, and there are trips, you will see tour buses uh, with people staying at local hotels and motels to shop the malls. Um, so that kind of thing may still occur, but again, with a tightening economy, even those kinds of trips are going to fall off, I And think. tour bus companies have to pay for gas, too. Precisely. So the cost of doing that will rise, too. The number of retail brands out there, bra retail brand, you know, known brand retailers. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether we're seeing a contraction period or whether we're basically staying the same, but the, the retail brands that are becoming a big deal, or at least being talked about. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if they are likely or to, to pick the outlet channel at some point. Well, there are a few things to say about that. One is that if you were starting out with a brand new brand, mm -hmm. no prior knowledge, and you could pick it to be anything you would like, 
most manufacturers or designers would not choose the mass market lower price value position to begin with. They'd start out at a little bit higher level, try to create some awareness and positive feeling about the brand before they go broad. Mm -hmm. So probably smaller, newer designer brands are not going to do that. The interesting thing that I've seen in my research, and, and I think is obvious to anyone who is a, a thoughtful shopper, is that the mainline brands have already, in effect, done this. They have um, multiplied the subsets of brands that sit under their brand umbrella. So uh, you may know the brand name Donna Karen, but Donna Karen has DKNY. You may know the brand name Ann Taylor. Also, both of these are women's clothing brands. Ann Taylor, which is a uh, medium bridge to upper kind of a brand, also has a different brand called Ann Taylor Loft. And that only sells basically at outlet stores. So they mm -hmm. have Ann Taylor Loft outlet stores, which borrow the brand equity, but try not to tarnish the upscale name uh, of the Ann Taylor brand at the regular stores. So I think that whether you're the new brand and want to be more upscale or you're more, a more established brand, you might try to protect yourself at the top end. Some do it much more than others. Um, and so that's a strategic choice that they make. Mm -hmm. Ralph Lauren uh, has a huge, huge presence at outlet stores with something like 125 or more outlet stores in America. It's clearly part of their core strategy um, to be in outlet stores as well as to have a high, um, high quality, mm -hmm. high service sort of a brand name at the couture level. And so they try to manage the brand stable in that way. One of the things that uh, has amused me over the years of many years of shopping is that mm -hmm. in outlet malls it never seemed to bother the customer when outlet centers basically got away from the sort of bare bones aspect right. where there was you know old merchandise from the regular stores flowing in and so forth and now so many of these outlet stores are, basically have dedicated lines of merchandise that you will never see That's in right. the full price store. That never seemed to bother anybody. And why do you think that happened? You know, I know that for some consumers, they are not fully aware that this is not the same merchandise. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little subtle sometimes, even if you've got a different brand name on the marquee on the front of the store. If it says Ann Taylor Loft, everyone will not figure out that that is not Ann Taylor. The clothes look similar. It's very difficult to mm -hmm. tell them apart. Um, so you don't know, unless you've asked, that, for example, uh, they might have a little bit different fabrication, a little bit different quality of fabrics put in the, the clothing that they sell there. It's not bad. It's just not Ann Taylor, exactly. So some consumers, I think, don't know. Other consumers, um, I think, recognize that, particularly in the area of apparel, we're talking about fashion. The question is not, will this piece of clothing last for the next 10 years? The question is, is it fashionable and can I wear it this season and maybe next? Now, if that's the question you're asking, um, then the really fine make, the terrific fabric, and the it'll last for 10 years phenomena are not important to you, right? And so if that's the case, so what if the brand is slightly different or the manufacturer is not quite as good? Um, We've seen very huge success stories like H&M and Zara, two different retailers um, who have really pushed that positioning very hard. Value pricing, very competitive prices, um, not super high quality of manufacture, extremely stylish. And that's a very successful retail strategy all of its own, which has a different angle on it even from the, the two that we've been discussing here. But obviously it is uh, those stores with their approach to fast fashion and pricing yeah. uh, in, in a very subtle way are diffusing the impact of the outlet mall. In some ways, absolutely, because there's only so many dollars you're going to spend on fashion clothing that will only be good this season, particularly in the target market for a store like that, which is going to be teens, 20s. Those young people are ready to turn over their fashion next year. They won't wear something that's out of fashion. So filling their closet is not the point. It's getting a few things that are really stylish right now. So how did your research impact your own shopping habits? 
It's an interesting question. I found some things out when I did my field research on outlet mall pricing versus standard mall pricing and also product availability that have changed the way I've looked at certain brands. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you two examples that have been sort of useful to me, but they're indicative of what I've learned about other brands too. So um, we'll think about two women's clothing brands here in the United States. Uh, one is Dana Buckman uh, and the other is Jones New York. Both of them make clothing that a woman could wear for business purposes. Uh, Dana Buckman has a little bit higher fashion positioning than Jones New York, but there is some overlap in what they, uh, what they have to offer. I found that uh, when I went into the Dana Buckman outlet store, they never had, uh, at the beginning of a season, they never had the product that was available at the department store. And we went back and did another wave of shopping some weeks later, and I discovered then that the same product, which by then had gone on sale in the department store and was a magical 40% off, I believe it was, was now available in the outlet store magically at exactly the same price. Okay, so now what I infer from that is that Dana Buckman, the manufacturer, is saying to the department stores, we're gonna give you about six weeks. You'll have a six week head start on us. You can price at list price, but then the product that we have available is going into our outlet stores at 40% off. Now, if you're running a department store, you know what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. You're gonna price at 40% off right. in week six. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of useful to figure out which brands are holding off some number of weeks and if you love a brand, you might yourself hold off and go to the outlet store or wait to shop the department store because it's predictable what the price drop will be. Now, contrast that with a Jones New York. I found to my surprise that current season, brand new season merchandise was simultaneously available in the outlet mall store and in the regular department store. What I would be the, the benefit of that? Well. I do not know. I have not talked to the mm -hmm. managers at Jones New York. My impression, or at least something that's consistent with the data is this. If you're trying to sell a brand that is a little more broad market, Dana Buckman is a little more up market. Mm -hmm. You want to be a little more broad market, then a core part of your consumer base is in fact going to be people who are a little more price sensitive. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm a manufacturer, I can sell that product in my outlet stores at the same profit margin that I would get if I sold in a department store. Now, you, the consumer, will pay a lower price mm -hmm. because we've cut out a middleman and thus cut out part of the margin that you pay for when you shop at the department store. So I think they're trying to hit the market at the beginning of the season and hit all of the people in their user base, which is a broader base than a slightly more upscale brand. So I kind of use that knowledge when I think about which brands I might want to shop for for certain purposes and when I want to shop and what price I should expect to pay. I think I'm a little more savvy shopper, but I still love a deal. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Coughlin. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. The Kellogg School of Management develops global leaders who make contributions of lasting significance for the world. Learn more at kellogg.northwestern.edu.